Hello everybody, you have tuned in to Eric Jose on Making a Murderer on YouTube. I cover virtually any aspect of making a murderer. I go over the evidence, the documents, the photos. So if you'd like, stay tuned and in the future I'll have many more videos besides the one you're about to see. Hello folks, how you doing today? As promised, I've finished my pumpkin pie and here we go. We're ready to go after Nancy Grace. Now, I will say this. Nancy Grace did do something lately that I thought was pretty stellar. And some people have been wondering, you know, how would you how would you even know about this Nancy Grace thing? You know, nobody's even going to listen to it or whatever. Well, I disagree. She recently was able to help a family find, you know, the remains of their loved one, a missing army veteran, and it was they did she did some good work that got the the cold case unit in the area from where this this army veteran was from they were able to find his remains and they were able to bring closure and actually get you know arrest the guy that was you know at the very least involved so that was why i was kind of listening to nancy grace's stuff and then got to the october 10th of 2017 crime stories where i just heard uh, manifest lies or untruth you know maybe maybe Nancy believes the things that she's saying but I'm here to show you today that she is mistaken now the other issue I have with Nancy is the way that she chooses to inflate or to um, to embellish because what you're going to see here in the opening clip, folks, is she's going to open up by talking about Teresa. How she was a lovely young girl with brown hair and she was a vibrant young girl and she was, you know, a photographer and she was a go-getter. And, and all the things that are great about Teresa, all those things, you know, hey, and that's awesome. I, will, I think that people should be saying lots of great things about Teresa and, and I have no issue with that, of course. Okay, just want to make that clear. Teresa was a very wonderful person and and I have no issue with that but where I do have an issue okay is when Nancy Grace uses all that imagery of Teresa to open then tells a lie or conveys an untruth whether she realizes it's an untruth or not and that is where I have an issue because you are using all of this imagery of of somebody this of Teresa in this case and playing on people's emotions so that you can tell an, a lie because you want to maintain the image of Stephen Avery that you have had in your head since the beginning when you first got your misinformation that is the problem I have here so as far as it as far as as celebrating Teresa as the very wonderful person she was I have no issue with 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 Nancy on that what I do like I said what I do have the issue with is the way that she used that imagery with a lie to make people that are listening to her automatically believe what she said is true and and believe that Stephen Avery is guilty it's it's a dirty tactic it's very dirty so we're going to move into that first clip now, and we'll come on back. When I first encountered the case, I was covering it as a missing person. Teresa Hallback, a 20-something-year-old girl, just beautiful. She looks like the girl next door. For some reason, she always reminds me of Mary Ann on Gilligan's Island. Um, not necessarily physically. Upbeat, photographer, trying to make her way in the world, brunette, big brown eyes, always smiling in every picture I ever saw of her. And she was taking pictures, photos for Auto Trader, I think it was. And she did not want to go to a certain gig because the guy was creepy, like answering the door, nothing but a towel. I mean, I would turn around and leave right there. Okay. But that aside, she needed the money. She got a call back from the guy to take a picture of a vehicle for Auto Trader. She heads out the door, tells her, co tells her co-worker she doesn't want to go, heads out the door. She's never seen alive again. Of course, I'm talking about Stephen Avery, the star of Making a Murderer uh, on 
Netflix. Okay, so, like I said, my issue here, she claims there that Teresa was afraid of Stephen Avery. That he, that he was creepy. Now, whether she thought he was creepy or not is another thing. I've known lots of girls that think guys are creepy and laugh at them. Okay? So, the creepy <clears throat> doesn't necessarily mean squat. Because the fact of the matter is, is as I'm going to show you right now, in a document from the official investigation, okay, that Teresa went there willingly, knowingly, and all these claims that she was afraid and that she was, that she went there against her will, it's all fantasy made up by Ken Kratz and the investigators because they were desperate to get people believing that because, like I said, they were worried because there was no trace of Teresa in the trailer or the garage or anywhere else that was helpful to them. Okay? And they were like, holy crap, what are we going to do? Because all they had were these bones that were actually in a few different spots <laughs> and no trace of her herself on the property. So, we're going to move in now to the document that proves Teresa was not afraid and she went to Avery Salvage willingly and that she was merely joking about joking around about the fact that that she was going there to, to see Stephen now this is a photo from the of the documents that's used on Imgur a bit thing is, is that it's not actually Don someone's put Don's name over Higgs here so Higgs attempted to call Halbach and left her a message Halbach called back to the office when Higgs was out for lunch Higgs called Halbach again in the afternoon and spoke to Halbach, who stated that she was on her way to the Avery property to take a photo that had been previously requested by phone that morning. Halbach was aware that the Avery brothers lived on the property and where they were and where she was traveling and told Higgs that the family owned two or three houses on the same road. Halbach and Higgs had joked about the past about when Stephen had come out in the towel. So that's the issue I have there with, with Nancy Grace, you know, bringing up the images of Teresa and everything to, to play on people's emotions and then to tell a lie to cause those people and pit their emotions against somebody with a lie. Okay, look, if, 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 if Nancy Grace said something truthful after that, I wouldn't be talking about this. I would, you would, I, there would, I would have never said a word. But she didn't tell the truth. So, now we're going to move on to the next thing. The next thing is the, the, the part where Nancy kind of sets up, she does a little more setup, conjuring imagery that's meant to, to pull at people's heartstrings and to, to, to make them remember things that you know she's 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 very very sly with what she's trying to do I'll tell you that very sly but she's conjuring up imagery that is meant to band people together and then following it with another lie or a misrepresentation of the facts and this is all around I mean this is all going around Tom Fassbender's big whopper so that's why I'm leading up to that. I'm going to have, I'm going to have Tom Fassbender lie at the very end of this because I want to show what led up to and what was around that lie by Tom Fassbender because I think it's important. I think it's very important because this 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 whole entire little podcast whatever it is on XM it was it was misrepresenting facts and 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 like I said there's no excuse for Tom Fassbender's lie. He knows better. He knows that it's untrue, and yet he told it, and he told it with gusto. So, we're going to move into the next bit here, where we see uh, Nancy s setting up Lee to misrepresent the hood latch experiment results. Crime online. Um, I will never forget the first time I smelled burned electronics or plastics. It was after 911, September 11, in New York where I was living at the time of 911 and the whole city smelled like burning 
uh, plastic or electronics. I mean, nobody had to tell me what it was. I knew what it was. I'd been to a million arson scenes, and I hadn't smelled it so heavily. Oh, is that so, Nancy? You've been to hundreds of crime scenes where you smelled electronics, and you just had to conjure up images of 911 when talking about this? Really? So, and like I said, wouldn't have a problem with it if she didn't follow it up with lies or untruths or whatever you want to call them but they are not they are not facts and they and i will show that lee yep absolutely they and there was people like like mr fassman said there was a lot of evidence that was left out of that documentary including people did say they smelled burning plastics electronics something coming from that burn pit and one and something else he brought up about the the dna on the hood latch that was one of the reasons the judge actually denied this this new motion because his attorney Avery's attorney Zellner she said something that she tested 11 or like 15 people she tested 15 people with their DNA on the hood latch and only 11 people's DNA matched so she's trying to say there's no way to say Avery's DNA could have matched which of course the judge says even if 11 or 15 people did not match that doesn't mean one particular person wouldn't have left DNA Okay, so you see what happened there, right? So after she gets done talking about 9-11 and how she knows the smell of burning electronics, all that, and then she throws it off to Lee. And Lee says, oh, yes, oh, yes, the smell of burning electronics. And, and that's one of the things that there was a report of it, you know, and she's right. Okay? That is not a lie. Okay? Just in case anybody was expecting me to say that. No, that wasn't a lie. Okay? There was a report that somebody said that they did smell burning electronics that night. Okay? That wasn't the lie, folks. However, I will point this out about this person that, that reported the burning electronics. How is it that somebody smelled burning electronics from her PDA and all that stuff? But nobody, not even Brendan when he was in the confession... Anybody ever reports to smelling the tires or the body burning in the burn pit. The only report we have is of electronics burning over in a burn barrel. But not the horrific smell that would have been coming off of a burning body and tires. Mm -hmm. so, so, I'm not saying that's a lie. I just want to make that clear. But I am saying it's an awfully suspect... Um, statement to be to be to, to be honest so now we're going to move to the part where <clears throat> we're not going to call it a lie but after nancy's little 911 imagery to lead into this where lee just didn't understand what she was saying i mean it's just there's no way there's no two ways about it she's thinking something about the the hood latch dna the hood latch dna um matching steven or whatever no there was no question about what they found match steven the, the DNA that they found matched Stephen. That wasn't what was in question. Okay. So, this is why it bu bugs me that right before this bungling of understanding the hood latch experiment, Nancy was conjuring up images of 9-11 and, and, and trying to, you know, play on people's emotions. So, what end, what's really going on here, and I'm going to show you the documents. What's really going on here is Leia has it backwards. Okay, number one, they're not. It's not about Stephen's DNA matching. It's a, it's not about anybody's DNA matching. What it's about is the fact that they found 1.9 nanograms of Stephen's DNA on that hood latch. That's how. That's what came in on the swab, the swab that was supposedly uh, from the hood latch. Okay, 1.9 nanograms. Okay, that's almost two full nanograms okay that's a lot that's a that's a really a lot okay and i'm going to show you that because in the in the documents that i'm going to show you right now the experiment was with 15 people those 15 people they obviously cleaned it up after each person and and re-disinfected it and whatever so that they weren't having any residual effects but they had 15 different people come up, open the hood, 
they swabbed the latch and all that stuff and went and had the results. What Lay says, and this is why I know she's confused, because she's, number one, like I said, it's it's not about matching. It's about the, the amounts are odd. The amounts are not in proportion to the amount Steven supposedly left. So it was only four people out of 15 that left DNA on the hood latch. Only four out of 15. 11 people didn't. See, that's where, that's what the problem I had with how badly Lee was misunderstanding it there because she was saying 11 people left DNA. That's not the case. Only four. And those four people, all of them left less than a tenth of a nanogram of DNA on the hood latch. Less than a tenth of a nanogram. Do you understand? Less than a tenth of a nanogram when Stephen left almost two full nanograms 1.9 is just just shy of two okay barely short so that huge gap is why the hood latch experiment is important so for anybody that you know didn't understand that and and what and was confused by what lay was saying well i understand why because she was confused by what she was saying as well so I'm going to go ahead and show you the documents about the hood latch experiment right now so you can see that for yourself, you can see the amounts, and you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Furthermore, while 11 of the test subjects did not leave detectable DNA on the hood latch, the fact remains that 4 of the test subjects did leave detectable DNA on the, by touch. The report does not give any quantifiable statistics as to the amount of DNA left in his tests. This is from the decision by Judge Sukowitz that she was talking about, and it claims that there was no quantifiable amounts, right? This is from Zellner's motion. Less than a minimum detection threshold of the qPCR method. Less than 0 .005 nanograms. That's what the that's what you know most of the people, the 11 people left less than that on the hood latch. Four of the replicates, four of the replicates quantifiable DNA was recovered with the following results: 0 .05. 0 0.09 and 0 0.06 and 0 0.07 nanograms. These, these are minuscule amounts. And when you compare them to the to the 1.9 that they that they're trying to say that Avery left, you know that the that the scientist is probably right. They probably switched with one of the buccal swabs. Okay, so that's why you know Lay was just confused, and and so we'll just move past that. Now, we're going to talk about the fact that Nancy kept repeating herself, saying that Stephen had lied to her, Stephen had lied to her, Stephen had lied to her, on and on, you know, while she was doing all these other things, conjuring the imagery that she was bringing up, and all that stuff, all the while saying that Stephen had lied to her, and, I mean, it was just all this, and anyways, by the time, you know, towards the end of the show, she actually ends up getting the audio of Stephen and stuff from back then, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that she was trying to suggest that Stephen had lied to her and said that Teresa never came. And, and it, when it comes down to it, he never said that. She was mistaken. She kept trying to insinuate it all throughout the entire uh, show, you know. But he never told her that. It was all in her head. So I'm going to show you that right now. Come on. When I had him on my show on HLN, Headline News, he lied right to my face, Tom. He lied about what happened. That evening, why lie about it? Asking why Stephen would lie when he didn't. What does that mean? I mean, what if we turn that around here? What does it mean when you and Tom Fassbender lied, Nancy Grace? Why would you? Right? And then we interview, I interviewed Avery, and he lied about that evening. He did star 67, I think, is the one you use to hide your identity when you make a phone call and tried to call her and uh, waiting for her to get there. And then after she's dead, he then calls her with his with caller ID, calls on her phone so people can know he called. And, you know, it's 530 or 6. He goes, hey, what happened? You never showed up. He left that message. But to me, he said, she never came. And wait, 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 what did he say? That she came and she left. That was his story. She came, she took the pictures, and she left. But he's leaving her the message, which is caught on audio. Hey, where are you? You never came. So why the two different stories, Tom Fassbender? Why lie to me on national TV about what happened? 
What exactly? Stephen, uh, throughout his accounts, especially early on in the case, had varying accounts of what happened. Now, the call he made after she allegedly left at the, for his rendition, he actually didn't leave a message, but he did make the call, didn't hide his ID, and that was his alibi call because uh, he told us that she had left and, and he was going to call her back. Uh, nice. Stephen, I understand that Teresa came to your auto salvage lot to take photos for the auto trader, correct? Yes, she did. She came down by me. Okay, and Stephen, it's my understanding that also you state that you saw her car leave. Yes, I did. About what time? Between, she was there between 2 and 2.30. 2.30 in the afternoon. Okay, Stephen, how is it that her car could get all the way back in this pit area where there is, uh, well, I believe we're showing it right now. I mean, ha ha wouldn't she have to pass back by the office again? Well, on the, on the outskirts of the office, otherwise back by me or back by Redon's pit in the corner is all open. It's all open. Yeah, so everybody can drive in there. Okay, so there you heard Nancy talking about Stephen lied to me, Tom. Steven, and she says it like, Stephen lied to me, Tom. You know, like she's like, you know, acting hurt. Stephen never lied to her. Stephen told her the same thing he'd been telling everybody else. It's in her head. Somewhere in her head, all this is happening. It's bizarre. But she... Number one thinks that Stephen Avery told her that, that that Teresa never left. That was wrong. She found that out because she played her own footage and found that out. Then she was trying to claim that, that Stephen called Teresa and left a message on her voicemail or whatever. Well, that wasn't true either. He never left a message. He did call, but he didn't leave a message. So look at all these things that she has wrong. And this is all in an effort to build up Tom, Tom Fassbender's big whopper. And his big whopper is claiming that Stephen Avery called Auto Trader and said that Teresa never came. It's a complete lie. And Tom Fassbender knows it's a lie. And I'll show you that here coming up. One last thing we're going to talk about here is Nancy goes ahead and she talks about the bullet with Tom. So, I'm going to show you why the bullet is just so ridiculous. It's so beyond ridiculous that, honestly, Kratz and Fassbender and all of them should stop talking about it, in my opinion. They probably won't, which is good. Because it'll give me reasons to keep showing you what I'm about to show you right after this clip. I was going to mention was in the garage where we knew that that uh, Stephen had shot Teresa and killed her, a bullet fragment was found, and on that bullet fragment was Teresa's DNA, and also that bullet fragment was forensically matched to the 22 rifle hanging above Stephen Avery's uh, bedboard, which his nephew told us he had used to do this. And that was not mentioned in making a murder either, that the bullet was forensically matched to that 22 caliber rifle. So in order for police to have planted the evidence as it is now claimed, you're telling me not a bullet, but a bullet fragment and having tested forensically so many hundreds, hundreds of bullets at the least with the crime lab as a prosecutor. A bullet fragment is mangled. It is destroyed. It's a squished up, mutilated piece of metal. And this tiny piece of metal was part of a 22 uh, for a 22 weapon bullet, and it had Teresa Hallback's DNA on it. She was shot in the head. That was found in Avery's garage. Is that correct, Tom? That is correct. All right, all right, folks. So, you know, they brought up the bullet. So here we go. You see this picture? That right there is where the bullet is. Where you see the mouse? Okay. You see what's all that on that floor? Do you see all of that dust? That is concrete dust. That is a buttload of concrete dust all over that floor, and it's everywhere. It's in. It's even in that uh, tool shelving over there. Even, it's everywhere. It's. I mean, even on some of the stuff. At the, I mean, it's just everywhere. This dust is everywhere. Okay, now you got this dust everywhere, and and trust me, this bullet was here before the dust. You know why? Because 
they jackhammered up the crack looking for traces of Teresa. So if the bullet was used to shoot Teresa, that means the bullet should have been there before they jackhammered up the crack. You understand? Look at that bullet. Look at all the dust around. Does that bullet look like it's got any dust on it? No. That bullet actually looks like it's sitting on top of a, a, some dust. It's sitting on top of the dust. How does that work? How on earth is that bullet right there sitting on top of the dust? After Fassbender pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed Brendan to push things out to the garage, suddenly this little miracle appears on top of the dust from when they jackhammered the crack. So, that is the issue I have with the bullet. And since they brought it up, I just had to say it. Uh, but early on, he had told Auto Trader that she never showed up. Then it changed to she showed up, but I didn't come out. I saw her taking pictures. Then it changed to I did come out. She actually came into my house. Uh, so his, his story's changed. Your story shouldn't have to change if it's the truth. And if nothing happened, there's, there's no reason for that to, to occur. So you're right on, on, the, on the change. I think I remember this, Tom. Nope. Sorry, Tom. That never happened. Steven never called Auto Trader and said she didn't come. That that is a lie. You know it's a lie. We I know it's a lie. Most of any of the other people that 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 research this case with me know it's a lie. The only people that you have a chance of convincing with this crap are people that don't know any better. That makes you even a little bit more sleazy and evil. You understand that? Because you are deliberately trying to influence the people that don't know any better. That haven't dug into the documents. That don't know how full of it you are. That is really despicable, my friend. Very despicable. I don't give a damn how charming you and your wife are. That's despicable. Absolutely despicable. So I'm going to show you the proof right now, basically. He's a liar. Steven never called Auto Trader and said that Teresa never showed up. That never happened. That is a figment of someone's imagination, but it never happened. Upon arriving at Auto Trader office, Special Agent McGrath interviewed Rachel J. Higgs. Higgs stated that she had been working at Auto Trader magazine for approximately six to seven months and was a production customer service representative. Higgs recalled speaking with an individual who identified himself as Stephen Avery. He did not identify himself as Stephen Avery. She made this assumption. And I'm convinced of that, and I'll show you why. On approximately Thursday of 11-3-2005, uh, Higgs stated that earlier in the same day, Teresa Halbach's mother had contacted Auto Trader Magazine office and was concerned about Halbach's whereabouts. Avery called the office approximately two hours after Halbach's mother, possibly between 3 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. Avery told Higgs that he had had an appointment for a van and a truck to be photographed on 1031 of 2005. However, he had contacted Hallback on that day to see if she was still coming, and she told him she was headed in a different direction. Avery told Higgs that Hallback, by the way, if she had somewhere else she could go besides Avery's, and kind of shows she wasn't scared of Avery. But she went to Avery's anyway, you know what I mean? So, anyways... Uh, uh, he, Avery told Higgs that Halbach instructed him to call the office and reschedule the appointment. Avery, who also, also told Higgs that he had been contacted by a male individual who had identified himself as Teresa Halbach's roommate. This individual told Avery that they knew Halbach had been to his residence to take photographs and that they believed Avery had done something to Halbach. Steve, er, Avery... Uh, stated that he did not appreciate being accused of this by this person. Avery had the number of the individual on his caller ID and told Higgs that he would call her back with this number. Avery stated that he did not ha appreciate being accused by this person. Higgs stated that she looked on the computer and did not see a record for a Stephen Avery having an appointment and stated she would look into it. So, you, that bit about there about getting the call from Teresa's roommate. Well... That's because Teresa's roommate was looking at her day planner. And the guy on the day planner was not Stephen Avery, but he did have a van and a truck that he wanted to get photographed. I'm going to show you now. Okay, folks, this is the infamous page of, of Teresa's day planner, the one that Ryan Hillegas had in his possession 
afterwards that was with her that day. So, anyway, you see what it says. Steve Sheboygan. That is not Stephen Avery. Stephen Avery is not in Sheboygan. You see that it says large moving truck. Right? And it says also two vehicles. Okay? That's the moving truck and the van. This is who Mrs. Higgs was speaking to. I don't know how she thought it was Avery other than... Unless she was just like all the other level-headed, you know, people in this, you know, area that immediately jumped on the uh, bandwagon that Avery was guilty. Anyway, whatever happened, she's she was mistaken. It wasn't Stephen Avery. Stephen Avery did not call Auto Trader and say that Teresa had never shown up. That is the absolute takeaway here. Tom Fassbender lied. He lied willingly. And bald-faced lied, really. So, anyways, that's the proof there. Okay, so there you have it, folks. That's what we got there. Nothing but a just a symphony of half-truths, insinuations, and lies. And, and it all comes together to really just to accentuate and to push Tom Fassbender's whopper out you know and give it that much more force but it's a whopper it's a lie it's a lie people tom fassbender is in the present day still lying about this case you don't lie when you think you got it right you don't lie when you think the evidence speaks for itself you don't so there's our Nancy Grace beatdown for today, Black Friday, folks. Hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. And uh, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe, and we'll see ya. And that law enforcement can be further vindicated in the great job that they did on this case. Yeah, I wouldn't hold my breath, Tom. <laughs> <laughs>